This is Ryan Elliott for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. We're in Liverpool. It's the day before fight night with me, trainer Shane McGuigan. Shane, I haven't seen you for a little while. How are you, mate? Good, mate. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Now, as I mentioned, one day away. You're obviously up here for Robbie Davis Jr. I uh, want to go back to the weigh-in today. We saw him he's fighting Hank Lundy. Hank Lundy came in over the weight. I didn't see him return before I left. Can you tell me a bit about what happened? He was 141.4, and then he had two hours to make the weight, and he came back at about an hour and 20 minutes into the two hours. And he was 140.4, and then he just says, "I'm good," and uh, and that meant that he's good in terms of he's not he doesn't he's not going to make the weight. So it's only 0.4 ounces. It's not you know, I mean it's a title fight, but he's been in many title fights in his in his time, and he's I don't think he, you know does that last little bit of push he couldn't do it. So but, but you know the title's on the line for Robbie, but it's not about winning a title at this stage. It's about winning the fight and. Yeah, if he loses to Hank Lundy, it's still a loss in his record. It doesn't matter if he's 140.4. So it's it's important for for Robbie to sort of knuckle down, and you know, it, it's not, it's irrelevant about the belt really for us. It's just about the fight, and uh, just got to make sure that he's switched on. Speaking of Robbie yesterday, and prior to linking up with yourself, um, you, he'd had his frustrations with boxing. You know, he'd changed management and, and training teams, etc. He's coming off losses. He was really disheartened with the sport. He told me that coming down and being around the, the people in the gym and yourself has given him sort of a new lease of life. Have you noticed him growing in that environment since you've linked up with him? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, Robbie Robbie stays in in my house as well, four or five nights a week. So I see, it, you know, I see him on good form all the time. Um, Great, great lad to have around the gym. Um, he's full of, you know, full of positive energy. Um, been in the sport a long time, so for the one, for the young ones coming through that have only seen this environment, it's good for for him to sort of be able to say, like, you know, I was here, there. Or, well, I've been on this platform when it comes to promotions. Or, he's pretty much done it all. Um, he's been on different networks, been with different promoters, uh, you know, different managers now and different trainers. So. So it's a tough old sport, professional boxing, and it's it's quite a lonely one at that. So um, it's nice for him to feel like he's happy at the, at the tail end of his career. You know, he's um, he's given boxing a lot, and for him to be in a good place is, is is nice, just from a coach and a friend's perspective, like myself. Robbie was kind of in a position. Um, I think we spoke about in Liverpool before his fight, where promoters and managers aren't going to be looking to do him favours with fighters. Someone like Hank Lundy, the kind of win he needs to get himself in the mix for for the fights he wants and needs. I believe so. He needs to be able to beat people like Hank Lundy. You know, Hank Lundy is a good fighter. He's a very skillful fighter, good all-rounder. At the tail end of his career, um, I think he's 36 or 37. He's been in there with the best names po uh, about. You know, he's been in there with Victor Postel, uh, Crawford, um, Zapida in his last one out. So he's, you know, yes, he's had uh, what's it, nine losses or something like that, eight or nine losses, but they've all been against top operators and. Um, yeah, and the ones that, that that haven't, they've all been close. So, um, this is a must-win fight for for us, probably more so than someone like Hank Lunder. He's already made his name and his and his reputation. A bit like someone like Demarcus Corley. Remember how uh, it boxed uh, Mayweather, boxed all the greats, but at the end he was boxing people like um, Yigit and stuff like that. Yeah, he came over to, to these sort of seas. So. Um, but with that, he's a he's a great athlete. He's a, he's a good. Uh, that you know they they kind of last longer in the states. You know they, their fundamentals are good. Uh, they know how to how to get um, themselves through fights. You know unscathed and and cause a lot of problems. So it's just, it's a tricky fight for us, but it's one that you know we we like desperately need to win this fight. Um, and if he does win it and he wins it in good fashion, then. Um, it, it puts him on a, in a great position. You know, Zapida, as I said, is his last fight, and he went the distance. So if we can make a statement here, then then it, then it's huge. But a win is is, an, is the utmost. Uh, just on a few of the McGuigan gym fighters, Lawrence Akoli, I saw his tweet today. Gulamari and Egorov is off. Uh, Makabu looks like he's going to be tied up with Canelo. Uh, Myris Bradis, we don't know what he's doing. There's been a bit of radio silence about that fight. How frustrating is this for Lawrence when he wants to be undisputed champion? Very frustrating times, um, yeah. Because it's a, it's a well-known fact that Lawrence's ambitions are moving up to heavyweight, and um, if it's another year or two before we get that undisputed title, then then it might not be for us, you know. Um, he's huge for the weight, but it's not like he can't do it. It's just it's 
it's a lot of training that goes into getting him down to the fights, and he's not going to be out. He's not going to go and do it for the likes of, you know, Jay or Obtea or whatever his name is, or you know, people like that. The guys aren't really going to motivate him, or um, you know, we've got we, we've got our sights potentially on someone like Kevin Lorena at the moment, which is quite a good fight because he, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a good fighter. He was the IBO champion, but he's actually a he's vacated that now. But he's a he's a solid so, sort of fighter, and he'd be he'd be a good test. Um, and then you know, if it, but but more importantly, we we want the we want the unifications. You know, we want to make sure we we make statements before moving up. He's lucky, and he's in the position with the WBO that he will get a shot at the world title um, if he moves up to heavyweight and keeps winning. So you're, you're instantly mandatory if you move up. So um, and now that Usyk's had his fight, he's he's got um, he's you know, he, he was the one that was waiting there. He's He's sort of got that fight out the way. He's won it, and um, I'm sure he'll give someone like Lawrence a, an opportunity to fight for it. But it's just so backlogged up at heavyweight as well. That's why the, the immediate plan was for us to stay down at cruiserweight. But now it's becoming backlogged down there. And Gulamarian versus Egorov, which was a great fight, I was excited about that. And within the last 24 hours, it gets called off, which is just so frustrating. Um, but these things happen. It just means it's a delay in the process for us even more. Um, Maccabi versus Canelo I believe Canelo will beat him then he'll vacate it then he'll go to the likes of Richard Riakpour people who's in line or Machunu who's about potentially going to fight um, and it's that that's a frustrating one for us because we'll be waiting anyway for that for probably 18 months before, before that all gets sorted out and um, you know, Lawrence obviously wants to fight Bradis and that's a great fight for us but um He's got uh, up, Taya, Jay up Taya, that he's got a fight who's his mandatory as well. So it's it's frustrating. Hopefully we can either speak to Eddie and try and get him to pay some people to step aside some step aside money. But um, Canelo, in my opinion, is going to go up to cruiserweight for one fight, just like he did like heavy and then drop back down because it's not his natural weight and it gives him that fifth um, world title, you know, and that will be that will be huge for for boxing in Mexico and he'll be the first Mexican to fight uh, to win five weight weights uh, and also if you actually look at that discrepancy of weight it's from 11 stone to 14 stone four that's even bigger of a weight bracket between Manny Pacquiao fighting at flyweight to welterweight it's, ma it's crazy but there just hasn't been enough weight divisions within that he, you know, if it was if he was starting lighter it would have been like a seven or eight weight world champion which is just a phenomenal achievement it shows the the fighter he is it's just um, for us, it's frustrating because he'll just be up there and then straight back down, and then the belt will go, go go vacant. I found it interesting you touch on the WBO rule there that if a champion does move up, he does become mandatory. That's what happened with Alexander Rusik. With all the frustration at cruiserweight, and I know there's a bit of sorting out to do at heavyweight. Is that sort of the the golden ticket, so to speak, knowing that eventually he is going to go s straight into a shot at heavyweight title potentially? Yeah, definitely. But you know. It's a well-known fact in places like America and stuff, they don't really value the cruiserweight division. So we have to establish Lawrence Coley as a brand, as a name. Um, although he's a world champion, he has to become more of a household name because um, he's a dangerous fight for anyone at heavyweight and people aren't going to want to take that. And um, you know they're going to see him as a massive threat, but also his promoters aren't going to see him as a, as a massive draw until... That's why we wanted to become an undisputed or even a unified world champion moving up because that would give him a lot more gravitas moving forward. But yeah, look, he is, he's, he's mandatory in, in, that, in that governing body. And um, it's just so much, there's so many massive fights that need to be made at heavyweight. I think promoters are going to push him to, to, to the, to the you know, middle or back of the queue, which is once again, a little bit frustrating. Uh, Daniel Dubois, I've seen you post a photo of him on your Instagram a few days ago saying he's absolutely flying in the gym. Any idea when he's back out? We were supposed to be out on December 18th um, on the J Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury undercard. That got pulled. Um, Daniel, you know, there was a few issues there when it came to the sort of pro to, to the event um, and the sort of COVID restrictions and stuff like that, which we don't have to go into the details about. But long story short, we then we now be getting pushed to um, most likely February, whether it's early or, or late Feb. That's that's what we're working on. Um, we're still going down the WBA route. There's uh, Trevor Bryant is a is a is a name that you know he's got he's got the regular belt. And just as we were talking about with Lawrence, this heavyweight division is is stacked. So we have to sort of pick our route. 
without losing momentum in other governing bodies as well because uh, yeah, if you're going to win the interim belt like we did before then you lose your ranking in the other governing bodies and it doesn't really hold much much uh, much merit but if you do win the regular belt that's that's a, it's a genuine world title belt it's not one of the four major ones but it's still a world title belt it's, it's better than an IBO for instance and uh, you know it still gives us pulling power and it and it will draw draw eyeballs and attention towards us so um that would be the route for us and we're just sort of working out the right plan we are getting towards the uh, christmas time here where people start to wind down a little bit busy busy gym at the minute though how many have you got in over christmas uh we've got nine um in over christmas fowler's back in we've got cbs in well robbie will be off um Got Ellie out in January. Got Caroline Debar out in January. Got the Azines brothers out in February. Got Lawrence and Daniel out in February. Potentially Fowler out in February. So it's busy. Um, I'm, if I've missed anyone, I'm, no CBS will probably be out in March, and I don't know. Well, you know, Robbie might be out in March or April. So um, the Christmas time, we're going to take a little few, a few days off, but we'll have to work throughout that between Christmas and New Year's. But that's just normal. You know, I've, I've done that. You know my whole whole professional career when it comes to coaching, and um, it's frustrating for the boxers. You know what I mean? It's it's frustrating, but you know because they got to have to work, watch their weight and all that. But um, it's a needs must. I'm glad that's a worry I don't have over Christmas. Shane, uh, the Azim brothers, you mentioned them there. I saw them down at the Cambrook press conference, uh, speaking to Amir Khan, taking some photos. Is that the bill they're going to be on? Most likely, yeah. There's a um, there's an ultimate boxer on I think on February the fifth. Uh, that is the 29th of January on which has got the Williams versus Eubank which is a great card I think that's that's where Caroline's probably going to be out uh, most likely and we were trying to get them out on that but realistically the turn turnaround time will be too short and I would rather them go on the, the Khan uh, versus Brookville you know Adam and Hassan have got fantastic support within the Asian community but Amir Khan is the sort of the main face of that uh, of that community so if we can get that um, sort of the, you know the the fans off the back of, of him, uh, then it'll be fantastic for for the boys coming through. Just a quick one on Conbrook. There's a bit of intrigue around the fight because nobody seems to know how much either have got left, and it's kind of hard to split them. Can you pick between them? I change every day to be honest because I thought Amir when he boxed uh, Terence Crawford, I think he looked like he was done, and then I saw Brook box Crawford, and I thought he looked even more done. Um, you know, it's so, but the two of them were in there with Terence Crawford, who's razor sharp, punches long, fantastic. Like, he's just he's getting better all the time, and um, it's hard to judge what how much they've got left when they're in there with a guy that's so skillful, so strong, so experienced, um, and he's at the height, he's at the peak of his career, and they're at the the tail end of it. So, even if they were at the peak, they still wouldn't have beaten Terence Crawford. So they're going in there, at, you know, at the, at the, you know, where, where, where on a percentage are they when it comes to where they were at 100%. But Amir Khan's 100% has boxed a much better caliber than Kel Brook has. Let's not, you know, let's not make any, uh, you know, too much of a debate about that. He's boxed much better competition, but he hasn't, you know, he's, he's, he's beaten the likes of Maidana, people like that, but... Um, it's it's just one of those arguments that we've had the whole time, you know. Kel Brook bo boxed and beat a, a top peak Sean Porter, a guy that pushed Errol Spence close, you know, uh, was winning rounds up, up until we got stopped against Terence Crawford. So it's you know there's arguments all the time when it comes to you know, those two going against each other. But I just think styles make fights. I think the power obviously lands with uh, with with Kel, but the speed is with Amir, and both of them have chinks when it comes to their punch resistance, especially at, at this stage of their career. So is it going to be who lands first? Maybe. Um, weight's going to be a big factor. They've got a rehydration clause. So it's great that the fight's been made. It's far too late. Um, everyone said that about Mayweather versus Pacquiao, but Pacquiao went on to win a world title afterwards. Um, these, these two, I don't think any of them will win a world title afterwards. I think it genuinely will be their last fight. But I'm glad that it's been, you know, it's, it's happening because boxing's just 
saturated at the moment it's it's full of so many stars and um and so many people coming through and it's great that this especially in the uk there's so so much quality of fighters um but these guys have been the you know from when i was younger looking at amir khan and even kel brook you know and um, working his way up through warren shows i remember watching him i think it was on the peter manafredo versus jo uh, joe kawasaki card back then just I think it was his first title fight or 10 round or something. I remember seeing these guys coming through, but they were such stars within their own right. I had um, Frampton Box on the undercard of Matthew Hatton versus Kel Brook of, and, and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's nice for them to get that massive fight before, before they uh, sail off into the sunset, as, was, as it were. Shed, it's been a big few weeks of the lightweight division, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. We've seen George Cambosos, Dieter and Tiafoma Lopez, Javante Davis and Devin Haney back in action as well. Belt aside, who is the best fighter in the world at 135? We've also got Lomachenko back this weekend, I have to say. Lomachenko is the best at 135. I said it ages ago. and it, like he, I had this debate with my dad all the time. He goes, oh, you know, Lopez you know, beat him up and beat him, we beat him 7-5 to five and Lomachenko didn't throw a punch for the first five rounds. But that's an arrogance. That's that's what it is. He, you know, he 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 did that. He does that within it. He says, "Oh well, I'm not getting hit, so I'm the undisputed champion, or he should be the undisputed champion. So I don't need to win these rounds or work on these rounds. At least I'm not getting hit, and and you know, I'm landing a few flicky jabs or whatever. And then the, then it goes down to who's who's forcing the fight. And Lopez was forcing the fight for the first five six rounds, but he didn't really land many. And I think if they were to box again, because there was enough scene in the last half of the fight to say that. I mean, he had a great 12th round, Lopez, but still, from the seventh onwards, he won every round, you know, uh, Lomachenko did. And, and if he started that earlier and he was able to make, especially now that Lopez has sort of outgrew the weight, um, Lomachenko beats Cambosa hands down, probably stops him. Um, but he's also getting he's also getting on a little bit. He's not what he he once was. But just my opinion, I think the best at 135 is, is still Lomachenko. How do you expect it to deal with Richard Comey this weekend, that said? It's going to be like uh, Pacquiao versus Joshua Clotty. Be like a Bill Bamboozle. I think if he does stop him, it will probably stop him um, late on. Or maybe even uh, Pacquiao versus Margarito or something like that. Do you know what I mean? It'll, be, it'll, just, it'll probably overwhelm him around 10 rounds. Last one to get your thoughts on. Uh, Fury White has now been officially ordered by the WBC, so negotiation period is underway. With the trainer hat on, what is Dillian White's best chance of having success in that fight? I think Dillian White is is going to have glimpses of success in that fight. I think people would be naive to think that he's he's you know he's he's not because yeah he gets hit and hurt. Um, the people that have taken out Dillian White have been massive, explosive one punch knockout artists um, and I just I'm not sure if Fury has that I think he'll he'll be able to stop him but it'll be an accumulation of fights and with that he's going to put himself in the firing line um, to to get nailed himself but can't underestimate Tyson Fury's fantastic fighter he's done you know he's been beating people like Derek Chisora who's still giving people hard fights at this stage of his career he beat him when he was only like 24 years of age or something he's a phenomenal fighter but Guys that impose themselves and guys that put, put him under pressure aren't afraid of him. And that physically strong, they always give him a hard fight. And I think it will be a fantastic fight. Um, Dylan needs to work the body and set a pace that cuts the ring off, try and get as small as ring as possible. Um, Tyson's going to have to change his game plan. He's been working for the last two and a half years against one opponent, a guy that's a big power puncher, throws about 10 hard punches around. Dylan White, so he's a combination puncher. He whips the body well, um, and he's he's in your face. So he'll be right up for it as well. So I think Tyson has to sort of work more on bringing his weight down a touch, a little bit more working on movement and um, and not trying to trade up every every time. You know, not trying to stand in front of him. Going back to a little bit more angles and movement. Um, it'll be a good fight, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I think Fury will probably beat him on points, so or potentially stop him in the tail end you mentioned it there when with someone like Fury I know he's changed his style a bit for John A. Wilder and under Sugar Hill but someone that, that moves his upper body so well you touching it briefly there I was hoping you could expand how important is it for Dillian White to work the body 
big time. You know, the, bo- the body doesn't move, and, and Fury's got great head movement. You see him, there's those clips on, on Instagram where he's holding the ropes and he's making, I think it was Otto Wallen or something, miss with every shot. So you can't try and head hunt with a guy like that. He's, you've got to try and whip in the body. But one thing that Dylan White is, he's so physically imposing and he's so physically strong. Um, he's got long arms and he can work in combination. So it's going to be, I'm excited about the fight. I really am. Because of the fearlessness of Dylan White, the fact that he'll have no respect for Tyson Fury. And Tyson's had so many good wins now, and he's so good at getting into people's psyche and mindset that he's just, that's his, in my opinion, Dylan White is the guy that's, that won't, he won't let on to that. He'll just be him. And, you know, that, 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 that is the intriguing part when it comes to, to this fight. Also, he's got a fantastic left hook. Whether he can reach him with it, whether Tyson stands in front of him long enough, I don't know. But it's uh, you, you're not going to get a bad fight when these two mix it up. You know, you might get a really boring fight when it comes to uh, Usyk versus Tyson Fury. That could be an absolute stinker. It could be like worse than uh, Klitschko versus Fury. But Dylan White's going to press the fight and he's going to make it exciting. He's going to make it a dog fight. And I think Tyson, you know, he's showed enough in his career. As I said, he's boxed the likes of. Chisora from when he's a kid so he's got plenty of that in him it's just going to be a hard fight for him um, and he doesn't and Dylan doesn't when he has been knocked out he's jumped straight back in there and had no cares you know what I mean going straight back in there going in with the same person he doesn't try and mix it up and change it up he doesn't try and box on the back foot for the whole time he just goes I was doing well I'm going to do it again I just got caught with a good shot and that level of fearlessness is, is something that's uh, got him to where he where he is so that's why i'm excited about this one all right shane we'll leave it there uh, thank you for speaking to boxing social and good luck tomorrow night with robbie yes.